Okay, ladies and gentlemen, I wanted to get us started just by asking uh, who won the $10,000? Was there anyone hit it big? Okay, oh, okay. this is going to impact our final year uh, party plans. But the uh, two, two very quick housekeeping things. Um, as some of you know, we have a first paper, uh, which we'd like to announce this week. Uh, we're still discussing some of the minutia amongst the TFs. Uh, we continue also to have people enroll uh, all the way through today uh, in the course. So we hope to have that out by the end of the week. Um, and we're also going to let that be reflected in the due date, pushing that back by a few days. I know some, there's some senior theses as well through that week. So expect that to be announced very soon. Um, uh, but I think it'll, the, it, everything will, you won't be liable for anything uh, that we're delayed on. You won't have to make that up on your own schedule. Uh, that'll be incorporated into whatever delay we have on the final due, due date. Um, second, I think most people in the course have probably by now gotten the survey email. Uh, we had a, I th at least 50% of the people have filled it out. If you did get that uh, and haven't filled it out, please take a moment. Uh, I think it takes under 10 minutes to complete it. That would be extremely useful for us. I may send, send it a reminder, uh, and apologies if you get that twice, but it would be really great to have more participation in that on the outset. Uh, finally, we continue to have a few large sections. We're going to see if we might be able to s put one extra section uh, in the schedule to alleviate some of the uh, crowding. Uh, we also have, will have that announcement done in the next uh, day or two as well. So that's all the housekeeping. Any course mechanic questions at the outset that I can help address? Okay, seeing none, the floor is turned <coughs> over to Larry. Great, so, so I want to start today with an exercise um, to try to make really obvious something that is already obvious but forgotten, not something we think about a lot. And the obvious question is, um, what techniques we use? We, all of us, you, or lobbyists, or maybe some of you are lobbyists. How many lobbyists are there in the room? <laughs> no. Okay, so anybody, the techniques any of us use to influence other people. Like what are the ways in which we get other people to do things that we want them to do. Okay, so by exercise, I literally mean we're going we're gonna, to uh, we're gonna construct this. Ways to get what you want, right? And you might learn something from uh, some of your friends here. So this is helpful because, you know, this could be on your way to becoming president, which one of you is going to be, I understand. But, um, but here's the thing. I want you to tell me what these ways are. And we're going to order them. In a sense, trying to go between the things that seem most effective or powerful, and then that's going to raise the question where, to the things that might be least effective or powerful, and it's going to raise the question where. So somebody start me off. What's a good way to, yeah. So dialogue. So talk to them, OK? So you see I can type, too. Um, so we're going to talk to them. Um, and in talking to them, we're going to be asking them for something. Is that the idea? So we're going to ask them. So uh, we could call this the please idea. <laughs> okay. What's another way? Get them to do what you want. Yep. Okay. So an exchange. So I'll give you this if you give me that. Or in the language of the reading, we could say quid pro quo. Right. Okay. So the first thing is please do this. The second thing is if you do this, I'll do that. Okay, what, how else? Yeah. Um, drop in. Drop in? Drop hints. Drop hints about what you want or what they want or? Uh huh. Um, okay, and what motivates them to give you what you want in that context? Okay. <laughs> okay, so so sure, that's a totally familiar way in which you get what you want. Much, you know, people like me who are totally incapable of asking for anything from anybody ever. This is how I ask. I say, geez, I really like so hints. Perfect. That's great. What's another way? Convince the other person that they came up with the idea that you were gonna uh -huh. <laughs> 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 So that's not quite deception. What is that? 
What is it? Inception? Okay. <laughs> Uh, yeah, up there. Okay, so this is another version of one. Great. So let's talk uh, and convince common interest. All right? Yeah. Both of you. First you. Okay, I just want to say blackmail. <laughs> okay. I'm not recommending that. Um, uh, but, okay, blackmail would be a technique. What, what do you... Uh, you know, lawyers can never figure this out. What do you mean by blackmail? <coughs> You're threatening them with what? Um, you're publicizing some uh, black mark in their character. Okay, so this is a version of a threat, right? So, so if we have a category here because we're running out of space, uh, um, so blackmail would be a threat. You know, you could beat them up. Or at least some people, I couldn't, but you know, one could, in theory, beat somebody else <laughs> up, right? So these are threats to try to get them to what they do. Right. You had an idea? Um, you can ask someone who has warranties for things that they're not going Recommendation, that's nice, okay. Um, okay, now, okay, let's start with these. Now think about <coughs> two different contexts. One, you're driving along the side of the road, you pull over at a restaurant, you're trying to get somebody to do something at that restaurant. And two, you're in your dorm or in your, you know, in a room with a bunch of your friends and you're trying to get them to do something. So first on the side of the road, which are the kind of techniques that are gonna be most effective on the side of the road, by which I mean among people you don't even know? So are hints gonna be a good idea there? I love to have some food. <laughs> I sure loved it when I got food the other day. <laughs> Is that going to work? What, what's going to work there? The asking, and very important. And of course, I'm asking, but I'm going to pay you. I'm going to pay you. Right? So you sit down at a restaurant, you say, I would like, you know, um, I would like the salmon which is okay, don't say you want the hamburger, that's not okay, but the salmon's good, or salad, that would be better. But asking for food that's implicitly saying, and I will give you something in exchange, quid pro quo, this for that. And the deal's over, you walk away, nobody's expecting anything more. Okay, but how, how about among your friends? Like if you're trying to get your friend to do something for you, would you say, how about if I give you 50 bucks? Go out with me, I'll give you 50 bucks. Does that work in that context? No, right? I mean, well, it might. It depends on your friends, I guess, right? <laughs> but the point is, it's not, it's not only that it doesn't work, it's kind of weird. It just doesn't even make sense, right? You get your friends to do stuff in a much different way. And so how could we in gen generalize the way in which you get your friends to do stuff? Yeah. It's a long-term relationship, uh, some longer than others, but the nature of that relationship, <coughs> some sociologists or philosophers would refer to as a kind of gift relationship. So in a gift economy, as opposed to a quid pro quo economy, what somebody's doing is engaging in the practice of helping somebody else in a context where everybody expects eventually the help is gonna come the other way around. So I give you a gift and expect that on my birthday, you'll give me a gift back. And importantly, if I'm going to do that in a way that doesn't insult you or doesn't manifest that I'm completely clueless about the way humans engage, I don't hand you cash, right? So I don't say, Oh, happy birthday, here's 100 bucks, right? I give you a gift and then you in return, well, it wouldn't be 100 bucks, okay, but you know, the point is, I give you a gift, probably about 10 bucks, all right, but I give you a gift and then I expect the next time around you're gonna return <coughs> something similar, right? And it's not perfectly calculated, but it certainly is an expectation, it's a sort of obligation, 
but it's a way for us to exchange things without me ever insulting you by reducing it to quid pro quo, reducing it for this for that. It develops this kind of thick relationship of exchange. Now, if we think about the difference between the quid pro quo and this relationship of exchange, um, if you are in a context where you can use these gift economy relationships ex of exchange, uh, that's going to be much more effective <coughs> in getting what you want than if you have to engage in a contract, a quid pro quo. It's going to be much more effective. But if you don't have that kind of relationship, you're on the side of the road, the only thing you do, then all you can do is ask for a quid pro quo. So the important thing is to think about the context and the nature of the relationship you might have. And then given that relationship, what tools might be available to you? And so when we think about the problem of people exercising undue influence, people corrupting a legislative process, we've got to first ask the question, well, in what context are they operating? Is it the sort of context where they can drop a hint and it be effective? Or is it the sort of context where the only thing they might be able to do is to offer a contract of this for that? Okay, that's the first thought. Okay, that should be pretty clear, pretty simple, the range of these different ways of giving. Is there a question about that before we go on? Okay, yeah. Should we limit the type of relationship? No, I'm not telling you to limit your relationships, no. But, I am, but I'm making obvious something that's already intuitive to you, which is what's effective and what's appropriate depends on the nature of the relationship you've got. So you don't know the person. The only thing that's going to be effective and appropriate is something that's like, I'll give you this for that. Or you know, maybe you appeal to their good um, uh, character by saying, you know, I'm hungry. Would you, hand, would you give me some food? You know, that's not a this for that. And maybe that works, maybe it doesn't work. But in that context, that's all you've got. But in the context of thick relationships, your friends, people you repeatedly deal with, maybe lobbyists and congressmen, you tell me what their relationship is. In that context, you wouldn't necessarily use the I'll give you this for that. Indeed, if you do use the I'll give you this for that, it kind of insults the relationship. Right? It kind of changes the nature of the relationship. So to your friends, I'll go to lunch with you if you give me 50 bucks. He's no longer your friend. <laughs> it's a pretty good way to signal you're either a, a crazy person or you just have no idea of the nature of this relationship, right? This, this is a friendship. You don't pay people to go in your friend. You know, but you know, you pay shrinks. That's what you do. You pay the shrink, right? For the what used to be the thing friends did. They talked to each other. Now you just hire somebody else to do it. You know, that <laughs> might be a good or bad thing. But the point is that's a different kind of relationship. And so what I want you to bring to the surface is if we're trying to think about the way in which you get others to do things, we've got to think about the nature of the relationship. And if we're trying to avoid people improperly influencing other people to get them to do things, we also got to think about the nature of the relationship. Okay, other questions about that? OK, great. So that's section one. Here's section two. On the idea of being influential. All right, so I'm sure you all recognize this wonderful person, Richard Nixon. You don't know that he was the inventor of the fist bump, but there he is. Um, <laughs> And you know, of course, he's not a crook. I want to say this to the television audience. I made my mistakes. But in all of my years of public life, I have never profited, never profited from public service. I've earned every cent. And in all of my years of public life, I have never obstructed justice. And I think, too, that I can say that in my years of public life, that I welcome this kind of examination because people have got to know whether or not their president is a crook. Well, I'm not a crook. 
I've earned everything I've got. You know, he's a politician. Presidents. He's a good enough politician. You can see on his face right now he realizes he's made one of the dumbest possible statements he could ever have made, right? To deny you're a crook as a politician is to admit you're a crook, right? So that was the problem which he was confronting because of this great place, the Watergate, where he turned out um, covers up or engages in a cover up of a set of activities which when it comes out demonstrates in a massive amount of influence peddling that had gone on inside of the Nixon administration um, in the grossest, most express way. So for example, there's a very famous incident where um, the uh, government was going to eliminate price regulation for milk, right? You might not know this, but the government regulates the price of milk. Um, and they were going to eliminate the price regulation of milk to allow milk's price to fluctuate in the market. Um, they announced this policy intent. A bunch of milk producers walk into the White House with a bag filled with $300,000 in cash, literally cash. And when they walk out, the policy of the White uh, Nixon administration has changed. They're not going to touch the regulation of the price of milk. That's the simplest, clearest example of kind of quid pro quo bribery that would go on inside of a political context. And, and that, with the whole bunch of other stuff that comes out, leads to Nixon's resignation, the only president to resign. But for our purposes, importantly, it leads to a set of laws which attempt to regulate influence peddling in the government. And these laws, in particular, attempt to regulate influence peddling in the context of campaign finance which is what that money for the milk regulation was supposed to support, the re-election of the president. Um, uh, uh, but that regulation was designed to make it so that this type of contribution, quote unquote contribution, had to be declared and was limited. Now those regulations passed in 1974 go to the Supreme Court and get tested in this case Buckley versus Vallejo in 1976. And Buckley has to think about two very different questions. Number one, can Congress limit the amount of money which people contribute to political campaigns? So at that time, the limit was $1,000. It says you can't give more than $1,000. And number two, can Congress limit the amount of money you spend to promote a political candidate independently of that political candidate's campaign. So you're, jo you're George Soros or you're the Koch brothers. You go out and you want to spend a million dollars promoting one candidate or the other. Does Congress have the constitutional power to say you can only spend a certain amount of money? And the case analyzes, the court analyzes this question by asking what asking whether these activities, contributing money or spending money, is a form of quote unquote corruption. So the court says, um, it's unnecessary to look beyond the act's primary purpose to limit the actuality and appearance of corruption resulting from large individual financial contr contributions in order to find a constitutionally sufficient justification for the limit. Under a system of private financing of elections, a candidate lacking immense personal or family wealth must depend on financial contributions from others to provide the resources necessary to conduct a successful campaign. And to the extent that large contributions are given to secure a political quid pro quo from current and potential office holders, the integrity of our system of representative democracy is undermined. Although the scope of such pernicious practices can never be reliably ascertained, the deeply disturbing example surfacing after the 1972 election, AKA Nixon, demonstrate the problem is not an illusory one. Okay, so they're saying that these contributions can be limited because if you limit them, limit them you will reduce the likelihood somebody's engaging in a kind of illegal quid pro quo. So you drop couple hundred thousand dollars in the White House to be used in a campaign for the president, that suggests that you're doing that for the purpose of succeeding and getting a quid pro quo to keep certain regulations the way they are. This law was designed to eliminate exactly that. Now there's a difference between actual quid pro quo, like I do this in order to get you to do something, 
and the appearance that you're engaging in a quid pro quo. You know, it's completely conceivable that when they walked in and dropped a couple hundred thousand dollars on the president's, uh, in the, for the president's campaign, they didn't want anything in return. They were just doing it out of the goodness of their heart, the desire to advance the political interests of a president who they thought was a great president. They didn't want the president to do anything in response. It's possible. But no <coughs> sane person would believe that's what happened. No sane person would believe that, in fact, they were doing it just for the reasons of advancing whatever interest the president had. Everybody would believe they were doing it for the purpose of trying to protect their own regulations. And that's the standard of the appearance of corruption. So the court says, in addition to the actual quid pro quo, almost equal concern is the danger of actual quid pro quo arrangements is the impact of the appearance of corruption stemming from public awareness of the opportunities for abuse inherent in a regime of large individual financial contributions. Here, as there, Congress could legitimately conclude that the avoidance of the appearance of improper influence is also critical of confidence in the government of representative, confidence in the system of representative government is not to be eroded to a disastrous extent. Um, okay, so both to avoid actual contracts, quid pro quos, and to avoid people believing that there are actual contracts, quid pro quos, Congress has the power to limit the amount of money you can contribute to a political campaign. Question about that? That's pretty clear, right? All right, what about money you spend independent of a political campaign? If you're entitled to restrict the amount of money you're giving to a political campaign to avoid the appearance or the actuality of quid pro quo, what about money given independently of a political campaign? Well, the court thinks about, well, what's it mean to give or spend that money independently? What it means is you're not spending it in exchange for something. Well, if you're not expending it in exchange for something, it can't be quid pro quo. And if it can't be quid pro quo, then it's not corruption. So in the very same opinion, the court says, we find that the government's interest in preventing corruption and the appearance of corruption is inadequate to justify limits on independent expenditures. So on the one hand, if you're giving it to the campaign, you can limit it, because that's likely to be, large contributions likely to be, or certainly likely to be seen to be quid pro quo corruption, this for that corruption. But if you're spending it independent of the campaign, then by definition, by definition, the court says it can't be in exchange for something. So therefore, it can't be at least this kind of in exchange corruption. This is the fundamental opinion in modern Supreme Court jurisprudence about the nature of regulations of campaign expenditures. A question about this so far. We're going to go through a couple of other points about this in a second, but yeah. Um, can you give an example of an example? Yeah, so for example, um, Sheldon Adelson in the last presidential election spent millions of dollars, contributed millions of dollars to super PACs who spent their money promoting the candidacy of Mitt Romney. When they spent that money, they didn't call up the Romney campaign and say, hey, we've got $20 million we're going to spend. How do you want us to spend it? Because if they did that, if they coordinated with the Mitt Romney campaign, that would be like a contribution to the Mitt Romney campaign. And you're not allowed to give $20 million to a political candidate. You're only allowed to give, right now, a maximum of about $5,000 in the election cycle. So as long as they don't coordinate, as long as they don't work with the campaign, as long as they just spend it independently, what the Supreme Court's saying is, if it's independent, there's no this for that. There's no quid pro quo, and therefore you have no justification to regulate it. Right? So you can spend unlimited amounts of money on your own, but you can only give a certain amount of money to the political can candidate. That's the difference. Now, you know, you're normal, intelligent people, or maybe you're not normal because you're intelligent, but whatever. You're intelligent people, and I tell you that story that, you know, Somebody gives $20 million to spend in a political campaign, and it's not in exchange for something. And you're a little bit skeptical. You're like, whoa, whoa, wait. If somebody's going to spend $20 million to help my campaign, 
I'm going to at least feel loyalty to that person. I'm at least going to like, well, at least I'm going to pretend like I like that person. I'm going to be eager not to upset that person. And what the court says is all of those influences might exist, but they are not something done in exchange for the money spent. It's independent of the money spent. It's, it's in that sense, an independent expenditure. Yeah. Is there any kind of a restriction on campaigns communicating with the individuals? I mean, is it just a secret ballot? <coughs> and can they coordinate outside of that to direct their money? So there's a category called coordination, which um, too hard for me to figure it out. It's very complicated law. But there's a category called coordination, which means if you coordinate, it's not independent. If it's not independent, you can't be giving unlimited amounts of money. But if you don't coordinate, if it is independent, the answer that Buckley says is you can give unlimited amounts of money. Okay. Now, here's the reason why this becomes important. What this opinion does, what Buckley does, is take this word corruption and give it magical qualities. And if you missed that, let me show you that again. Watch. Magical qualities. <laughs> And the magical qualities are in relation to this very important part of our Constitution, the First Amendment. The First Amendment, which says Congress shall make no law, by which it turns out they don't mean no law, but you know, they don't mean lots of laws. They mean you can't make lots of laws, or you can't make some laws at least, respecting blah, 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 or abridging the freedom of speech. And the claim that people who challenge the 1974 regulations or every other campaign finance regulation make is that if you limit my ability to give money to a political campaign, that's like limiting my speech. Because my giving you money is like my speaking, my expressing my support for you. I say, I like you a lot, so I'm going to give you $50 million for your campaign. And so they say, you're limiting my speech. And the First Amendment says, no law, no law limiting speech. So therefore, if Congress is allowed to pass one of these laws limiting my ability to give you $50 million, therefore limiting my speech, it's because Buckley has created this magical power in the word corruption. Call it corruption. If you can call the speech corruption, then you can abridge away. You can abridge as much as a, this quote of freedom of speech as you want. As long as it can be defined corruption, Congress can regulate. Well, okay, what that means is what corruption means becomes an incredibly important question for Congress, or at least for the Supreme Court, to make clear. Because if something can be called corruption, if a certain type of relationship can be called corruption, if quid pro quo is corruption, if dropping hints is corruption, then we can regulate not only quid pro quo, but also dropping hints. The point is, if you define it as corruption, then Congress can regulate it, the First Amendment <coughs> notwithstanding. So the Supreme Court's tried to understand what corruption means. And as the courts thought about it, it said, well, let's think about corruption as a certain kind of influence. And in principle, we could say the influence could be applied to Congress. Or you could say the influence could be applied to the people. We could be trying to influence Congress or influence the people. And the kind of quid pro quo corruption that we've just been talking about, the sort that Nixon was ac accused of, the sort that we imagine goes on when you give somebody $30 million to run their campaigns, is a kind of influence, not directly of Congress, but an influence on individual members of Congress. Now, some might say they're not just men in Congress, but it turns out the only ones convicted of criminal offenses have been men. So I've just included men as the members of Congress who you might be trying to influence. Okay, there's actually one woman, but all the rest have been men. Okay, but okay, the quid pro quo is an influence on a member of Congress. If I will do this in exchange for that, you say that to a member of Congress, like Randy Duke Cunningham, um, who was a uh, congressman who sold uh, defense contract influence in exchange for a yacht and a certain amount of money. Um, okay, so there are many who have engaged in that kind of behavior. This is the type of influence the court would clearly call corruption. It's an influence within, you can think of the economy of influence that is corruption because it steers the members away, members of Congress away, from a focus, which is supposed to be a focus on what the people want. In that sense, it's corrupting of their behavior, but it's corrupting at the level of the individual. 
We're only thinking about the way in which it affects the individual member of Congress and it's corrupting at them because it's undermining their representative function. They're supposed to be representing us. They're supposed to be thinking about us, the public interest, and instead they're thinking about their private interests as they take their money in exchange for doing something for the public. Okay. Buckley upholds the power of Congress to regulate exactly in that context. Speech regulations of corruption are going to be fine, right. as long as it's this quid pro quo. Then there's a period of time where the court thinks about the potential corrupting influence of speech on people. So the state of Michigan um, looked at inks, corporations. The state of Michigan thought, geez, corporations have a lot of power in Michigan. They have a lot of power in the political marketplace of Michigan. So they passed a law that said corporations weren't allowed to spend their money to influence political campaigns in Michigan. Um, and the reason for that is they say, well, corporations, you know, they have all this power in part because the state has given it to them. The state gives them <coughs> special corporate form like a limited liability because they're incorporated. They give them these favors and the corporations are using that gift from the state in part to influence elections. There's something unfair about that. So then Michigan says we will ban corporations from participating in this kind of political speech. And it goes to the Supreme Court in this case of Austin versus Michigan, 1990. And the Supreme Court says that's totally fine. Michigan can do that. And the court says, this is the language that says, the corrosive and distorting effects of immense aggregations of wealth, AKA, AKA the corporation's money, accumulated with the help of the corporate form, because they're a corporation, they got special privileges from the state, with little or no correlation to the public support for the corporation's ideals, all of that, the court says, is a different type of, quote unquote, corruption. Different type of corruption. It's not quid pro quo corruption. We're not talking about the way in which the speech actually changes what state legislators do. It's corruption because it's distorting the political process. But who is it distorting? It's not distorting the representatives. It's distorting the people people are becoming distorted. This speech is distorting the way they think about political issues. <coughs> and so that distortion, Michigan was allowed to remedy through this regulation, at least um, circa 1990 when the Supreme Court upheld it. So this is a kind of corruption, but it's a corruption of us, of people, not representatives in Congress, because of unequal money. And the remedy was to equalize the money so that we, the people, are not distorted by that distorting aggregation of wealth. Okay, now, that decision, 1990, was short-lived. You've, I hope, I hope, I trust, have heard of this case, Citizens United, decided in 2010, four years ago, um, where the Supreme Court reversed Michigan versus Austin. Supreme Court said, whatever corruption is, corruption is not that. Corruption is not about distorting how individuals in the political system are affected by speech in the political system. Corruption is about how representatives in the political system might be affected by influences in the political system. And even more sharply, the court made it sound as if the only kind of corruption out there is the corruption of quid pro quo that we saw from Buckley versus Vallejo. So the court in, in, the court in Citizens United says, the Buckley court explained that the potential for quid pro quo corruption distinguished direct contributions to candidates from independent expenditures. The court emphasizes that independent expenditure ceiling fails to serve any substantial government interest in stemming the reality or appearance of corruption in the electoral policy, uh, process because the absence of prearrangement and coordination alleviates the danger that the expenditures will be given as a quid pro quo for improper commitments from the candidates. So Buckley says, if there's quid pro quo, you can regulate it. If there's no chance of quid pro quo, you can't regulate it. Michigan, in Austin versus Michigan, was banning all corporate speech 
even independent of a political campaign. So the court's saying that can't be seen as corruption. Instead, Buckley identified sufficiently important interest in preventing corruption, the appearance of corruption. That interest was limited to quid pro quo corruption. Only kind of corruption is quid pro quo corruption, not this distortion corruption. Um, and then, very importantly, the court says, Justice Kennedy says, the fact that speakers may have influence over or access to elected officials does not mean that those officials are corrupt. Favoritism and influence are not avoidable in representative politics. It is in the nature of an elected representative to favor certain policies and by necessary correlation to favor <coughs> the voters and contributors who support those policies. Okay, now we're not gonna spend a lot of time on this very important point right now, but I want you just to flag it and remember it, right? Court says, and by necessary corollary, democratic politics means it's appropriate to favor the voters and the contributors. Now, I think it's pretty uncontroversial that <coughs> there's nothing wrong with an elected representative favoring people who vote for him or her. You know, you're a Democratic member of Congress, labor unions vote for you, you favor what the labor union wants in exchange for the labor union's votes for you or members' votes for you. That seems pretty essential if we're talking about democracy. It's about rewarding people who are voting for you. That's what the competition is. <coughs> it's less obvious that it also <coughs> means favoring the contributors to you. Right? Because the big difference between voters and contributors is that we all equally are voters. You're over 18, some states if you have an ID, but okay, we're all <laughs> equally voters, but we're not all equally contributors. So if a democracy means all equally participating in the process, it seems obvious that the voters might be favored, but it requires another argument to show why the contributors should be allowed to be favored. I'm not saying it doesn't, it's not possible to make that argument, I'm just saying, it doesn't follow, obviously. And certainly, whenever the Supreme Court uses a word like necessary, you know they're trying to hide something. So it's absolutely not necessary. It's, it's not absolutely clear. It's not like two and two must necessarily mean four. Not a necessary correlation, corollary. It's a very controversial contested corollary. This is the whole fight, which is covered by this particular way of talking about it. Okay. All right, so the point they want to say is we the people, this idea of the people are not going to be corrupted, this distortion of the people will not be seen, or at least we're going to say the government can't pass laws to remedy any distortion of the people by speech that might be too powerful. We the people are on our own in this sense. We have to take care of ourselves. No government can't be the guardian of equality in the speech market as it affects the people generally. Okay, that's Citizens United. Might surprise you, I hope it doesn't, but it might surprise you. I think in that respect, Citizens United was right. It's not appropriate for the government to worry about how speech affects us. Or it's not appropriate, or it's too dangerous, maybe you wanna say, but at least let's start with not appropriate for the government to try to regulate equality in speech across all contexts, where it worries that you're getting the right amount of speech from corporations and the right amount of speech from labor unions and the right amount of speech from Democrats, right amount of speech from Republicans. That's just a kind of morass that it's probably not appropriate for the government to be involved in. Whatever, it's not corruption. Distortion of speech is not corruption. You might say it would be corruption if we were you know, living in the area of Demosthenes. So what's Demosthenes' story? Demosthenes was such a great orator that he was required to put pebbles in his mouth before he spoke so that the quality of his speech would be, on average, as good as everybody else's. You know, if the whoa, 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 still he would be pretty good, but he'd be as good as everybody else. So the idea was we equalize Demosthenes so that he's not too persuasive. If that were our norm, then you would say that limiting corporate speech in this way might make sense, but the United States is not 
Greece at least yet. Um, so in this sense, the First Amendment does not permit this regulation of distorting speech. In this, in this way, we say regulation, uh, speech that might influence Congress might be called corruption. Speech that's regulating or affecting the people is not, according to the Supreme Court, called corruption. Okay, there's a big set of thoughts there. I want to pause now and make sure people are clear on it or you have questions about it so that we can move on to the next point as it gets to the readings we had for today. So questions about that? Yeah. Yeah, so the problem that the Michigan legislature thought it would try to solve is that corporations were spending an enormous amount of money in Michigan to persuade voters in Michigan to vote one way or the other in campaigns and also on issues that might affect regulation of those corporations. So GM, I don't know in particular whether GM did this, but here's an example. If GM came out and said, these minimum wage laws that they're trying to change in Michigan will destroy 50,000 jobs in Michigan. GM might pay for those ads. They would be advertised on the television stations in Michigan. They might say, your local representative supports changing the, mi the minimum wage law. Call your local representative and tell her that if she changes the, Michigan, the minimum wage law, we're going to lose 50,000 jobs. Okay, so there is GM in this hypothetical trying to exert influence by getting the citizens of Michigan to do something against politicians in Michigan who they don't agree with. So the fear, the thought in Michigan was, geez, this is really terrible. These companies have all this money. They're spending all this money. They're mucking up our ability to regulate in a way that we think should be regulated. So we want to stop them from trying to interfere in that way. And so they said, you can't spend your money in this particular way. And the court originally said that's fine, but the court in Citizens United said that's not fine. And the upshot of Citizens United is corporations have a constitutional right to spend their money at least independently of a political campaign. They can't give their money to a candidate. No, but that's the upshot of that. Okay, other questions? Yeah. Great question. Yeah, who knows? Right? Because the court in Citizens United said, of course, this is only limited to domestic corporations. But why? Why would it be limited to domestic corporations? <coughs> because if the point is that it's not corruption, if individuals are being persuaded by the speech, it's not all of a sudden corruption if it's Chinese speech versus GM speech. Like, why should that matter? And the answer is, you know, this is you know kind of beyond the reach of the course, kind of beyond the reach of even a First Amendment course. But the answer is. There's no good reason to distinguish the two. There's just a very clear practical reality that the court would never sanction unlimited foreign money in the form of guise of political speech, um, even if the court sanctions unlimited corporate money in the guise of political speech. So Citizens United and Buckley agree that contributions to a campaign, you write a check to Mitt Romney or to Barack Obama, can be limited. Citizens United and Buckley also agree that if you spend money independently of a political campaign, it can be unlimited. You can spend that money either to say, vote for Mitt Romney or to say, vote against anybody who doesn't support the Second Amendment. Right? Doesn't have to be limited to issues. There was a middle period of time between Citizens United and Buckley where the court said you can't regulate issue ads, vote against people who don't support the Second Amendment, but you can regulate political ads, vote against Mitt Romney or vote for Barack Obama. But all of that has been blown up by the Citizens United, so that's just, just think of it as if it's independent, it's unlimited. If it's dependent or if it's direct contribution, it can be limited. Okay, questions? Any more questions? All right, so 
here's how we see so. Told you. Um, here's the here's the critical final question then. One kind of corruption the court clearly identifies in Buckley and Citizens United is quid pro quo corruption. But one question we want to ask is that the only kind of corruption, the only way in which you might try to influence members of Congress. So we started with, when we started the class, this idea of how do you influence people? One way you influence people is through contracts. You go up to a member of Congress and say, I'll give you $50,000 if you vote in favor of the following bill. Um, I don't advise you to do that. Not only because it's a crime, but also because it's really ineffective. And it's really ineffective because in that act of saying, I'll give you $50,000 if you vote some for something, you're saying to the congressperson, you're a crook, or you have no integrity, and especially Congress people don't like to be called a crook or said they have no integrity. So that's a really stupid way to bring about the result. But let's get back to your suggestion, hinting. Right? You're George Soros. You spend millions of dollars in political campaigns. You show up on Capitol Hill and you hint, I would really like it if the following laws were passed. I'm not asking, I'm just telling you what would make me really happy. Right? Is there a quid pro quo in that? Plainly not. I'm not saying this for that. I'm just giving a hint. But depending on who you are, that could be a really effective way of influencing what Congress does. Really effective way. Yet it's not, at least so far, corruption because it's not quid pro quo. So the question that this case leaves open is, is quid pro quo the only kind of corruption there is? Or is there a kind of corruption beyond the very core idea of one in exchange for something else. Okay, so that's the question we're gonna look at. But first we're gonna take a detour through a school. <coughs> school of constitutional interpretation. <coughs> school of constitutional interpretation called originalism. Have you guys <coughs> ever heard of this word, originalism? You know what this means? How many people have studied it in a class? Okay, so academics don't like to talk about originalism because they think it's stupid. And uh, it might be stupid. But there's at least five members of the Supreme Court who take it very seriously. <laughs> so legal academics don't have a choice about whether they call it stupid. Well, they can call it stupid, but they don't have a choice about whether they take it seriously because it matters in the Supreme Court. So at least for probably five, it matters for. Okay, so how does it matter? Well, what an originalist says, what originalism as a school of interpretation says, is we interpret the words of the Constitution by understanding how the framers of the Constitution would have understood the term. So we use the word cruel and unusual punishments in the Eighth Amendment. It says there can't be any cruel and unusual punishments. An originalist, like Justice Scalia, says, okay, Go back to 1791 when the Eighth Amendment was ratified. Ask the question what the framers would have meant by cruel and unusual punishment. Whatever they would have meant, that's what it means today. So in 1791, flogging was common. If you did something bad, they wouldn't throw you in a penitentiary for five years. They'd bring you up into the town square and they would flog you. So Scalia would say, is that cruel and unusual? Well, in 1791, it wasn't cruel or unusual. So at least he says if he were a committed and principled originalist, he would have to say it's not cruel and unusual to flog someone. Okay? So this is the method. You go back to what they would have thought, and you ask the question what the answer is then, and that's what the Constitution means. Now, it's not necessarily the end of interpretation. You might say, well, that's what it means. Now we have to figure out how it applies in a current context. I'm not saying that, but it's at least the beginning of the interpretation. So that if for the originalists, for these really critical votes on the Supreme Court, you want to ask the question, for the question, is quid pro quo corruption it? The originalists would say, how would the framers have understood corruption? What would they have said it means? How they understood this concept, 
how would it have applied? Did it mean or would it have meant quid pro quo the way Buckley seems to think it meant quid pro quo? Um, did it apply to individuals or institutions? And if it applied to institutions, what would it have meant? Okay. Well, it turns out there's tons of writing about this particular question. <coughs> it's just, like we gave you some reading for Zephyr Teachout, but I want to introduce it by kind of a classic theorist on the framing periods, um, Gordon Wood, not theorist, historian, um, introduces the idea of corruption as a central organizing concept for the framing generation. Think of corruption as in corrupt as in bodies, right? Bodies corrupt, they corrode, especially older bodies as opposed to younger bodies. And what's interesting about the framers' way of thinking about things is that they thought of society as a kind of body. And they understood the way societies evolve through different stages of development. So Gordon would say, the history of particular nations and peoples, whatever may have been the history of mankind in general, was not a linear progression, but a variable organic cycle of birth, maturity, and death, in which states like the human body carry within themselves a seed to their own desolation, which ripen faster or slower depending on the changing spirit of the society. So societies grow up and then corrupt, become corrupt. And everything the framers were trying to do was to build institutions to slow that inevitable corruption. So their idea was every society grows up and becomes corrupt the way England had become corrupt. Maybe we can have some kind of fountain of youth like techniques, some tricks to slow the inevitable progress of the American society from this relatively primitive to this relatively mature corrupt society. Um, uh, and so as he says, when the American Whigs described the English nation and the government as eaten away by, quote, corruption, they were in fact using a technical term of political science rooted in the writings of classical antiquity, made famous by Machiavelli, developed by classical Republicans of 17th century England, carried into the 18th century by nearly everyone who laid claim to knowing anything about politics. Um, the corruption of a constitution's internal principles was the more obvious and most superficial danger. Now, they, at the framing, we're obsessed with the corruption of England. And what was the corruption of England? The corruption of England was different ways in which institutions no longer did what they were supposed to do because of the wrong kind of relationships inside the institution. So the crown had been able to evade the restrictions of the revolutionary settlement in 1688. Don't worry about that means here. But, and it found a means to corrupt the other branches of the legislature, upsetting the delicately maintained balance within the constitution from within. And how had the crown been able to do that? Well, the crown was supposed to exercise its power by basically prerogative, by giving orders through the rights granted to it by the settlement of constitutional authority. But instead of doing that, the crown had begun to resort to influencing the electoral process and representatives in parliament in order to gain its treacherous end. So it would effectively buy elections for particular members of, Congress, of the parliament. And by exercising its power to buy those seats, bind those members of parliament to the interest of the crown. So rather than parliament being independent of the crown, a significant faction of parliament would be tied to the crown and thereby parliament would be corrupted. So this is the idea. Not necessarily a quid pro quo, but a kind of hint. The king would say, geez, you know, let me just drop a hint. I would love it if people voted for this bill. I would love it. It would be good for me. Not asking you to, not telling you you have to, but I would love it. And in that system, people would find their natural influence driven towards the thing the crown wanted. Um, okay, so Whigs, these are the people that uh, Wood are talking about is focused on this idea of corruption. We're well aware that the last stage of a nation's life of luxury and its never failing attendant corruption will render easy the attempts of arbitrary prince who means to subvert the liberty of a country. What they're saying is in the last stage, when we all live in luxury, we're kind of there now, but you know, at least we are, um, it's gonna be hard to resist the corrupting influences of the crown. But during the earlier stages, the idea is we can do what we can to stop them from being corrupt by creating the right kind of relationships and avoiding these corrupting relationships. In the second book, he does, he does two more of these. Um, he says, um, each part of the, triad of king, lords, and commons, this is Britain, was praised for its independence. 
and any loss of independence was widely condemned as corruption, particularly when the crown gained power at the expense of the commons, the commons, the parliament. Um, and so the question was, how do you preserve the independence? And the way you preserve the independence was to avoid these kind of dependent relationships. And this objective of avoiding these dependent relationships was what, um, was what, uh, what is this, was what, principle of corruption was set up to avoid. So to set up the dependence, to avoid the way in which somebody being dependent on the crown would corrupt their influence, you could create independent property. That's one of the means that, that would suggest that was um, weakened in the context of Britain. Okay, so that was the background for the particular piece that we looked at here. So Zephyr Teachout is a professor at Fordham who wrote this really critically important piece which has changed the whole debate about American understanding of its own constitution. Not yet succeeded in convincing the Supreme Court, but here is a critical important step in that direction. So she asserts that the framers in drafting the constitution were obsessed, that's a technical legal term, obsessed with corruption. And they saw the document as a structure to fight corruption. So answering the question, what was the Constitution for? Zephyr says the Constitution was for fighting corruption. Now this language, structure to fight corruption, is a little bit modern. It might be better to say the document is a mechanism to fight corruption. Because if you think, how did the framers think? The framers were obsessed with things like this. They were obsessed with machines, complicated machines that if balanced exactly right, produced something really important, like you know, complicated clock, which if balanced and set up properly, produces reliable statement of the time. They thought of the Constitution in a similar way. There's lots of little <laughs> gears and cogs and springs and tensions that you build inside the Constitution to produce the result you want. And what's the result you want? According to Zephyr, the result is eliminate corruption. So these cogs are to that end. Um, it was the corruption of uh, the state legislatures that led to this federal constitution. And the federal constitution then has a whole list of devices that she says were inserted for the purpose of avoiding a kind of corruption. So she gives you that list. They are this chart, <laughs> very helpful, list of all the devices in the constitution. Um, I want to go through some of these a little bit quickly, but you'll get the sense of how they're working. So look at them. So Article 1. Constitution's Article 1 governs the legislative power. Section 2. House of Representatives. Sh it shall be composed of members of the House chosen every second year by the people of the several states, and the electors in each state shall have the qualifications of the legisl largest legislature in the state representatives. No person shall be a representative who has not attained the age of 25, not been seven years a citizen of the United States, and who, who, who shall not, when elected, be an inhabitant of the state in which he was chosen. Um, this provision, she says, achieves a number of anti-corruption objectives. First thing it does, the fact and frequency of elections. If you have elections of the people and they happen frequently, this is a device to avoid the government from becoming focused on something other than the people. That's a technique to achieve minimizing corruption inside the way the government's going to function. She does residency selection and qualifications. The big concern she describes them talking about on the floor of the convention is rich people hiring stooges to go move into a district and to run for Congress. So you basically have opportunists who move into a district and run for representative, but they're owned by somebody else, basically the device the king used in corrupting parliament. And that device then makes it so that the parliament or congress is not representative of the people, it's representative of the people who had hired those people, those stooges. So you create this residency requirement, you've got to live there. Originally it said, Originally, it had said you had to be a representative of the district you run. It's qualified a bit. You just have to be a resident of the states that you're going to run in. 
So technically, if you live in Massachusetts, you're allowed to run in any district in Massachusetts, but that's a slight quibble from what they had tried to do. What they're trying to do is say, you have to be a natural person from this district if you're going to run, because we're going to avoid the temptation to basically create stooges everywhere who run in the interest of the people who hire them. It's the same thing with the inhabitancy requirement that she describes. She describes the um, number of representatives in classic analysis of the difficulty of creating conspiracies. If we have a large number of representatives, it will be hard for them to conspire together. Hard for them to conspire together means it's hard for a corrupting conspiracy to succeed. So increase the number of representatives, you reduce the chance that the representatives will engage in the kind of corruption that they're trying to avoid. The Senate, they were worried precisely because it was so small, it would have exactly this feature. That's why the House is so important, because you have a large House, and the large House would guarantee that they minimize the chance for corruption. The first, first Amendment was not ratified, but the first proposed amendment is a provision that requires that the maximum number of people being represented would be 50,000 by a particular representative. If that amendment had been passed and had been changed, that means Congress would have to be 6,000 people large today. But the idea that if you got 6,000 people, it's going to be hard to coordinate to get them to conspire in a way that cor that's corrupting. So that would be a technique, one more technique to avoid this kind of corruption. Election by the people as opposed to election by the representatives in the state is a way to avoid the simple corrupting of the representatives in the legislature. It's harder to corrupt the people. And by the people, they mean all the people. Um, that's Article 2, Article 6. No senator or representative shall, during the time for which he was elected, be appointed to any civil office which shall have been created or the emoluments, the pay wherein has should be increased during the t such time. No person shall hold any office under the United States and be a member of either house during his continuance in office. So what's the dynamic this is trying to avoid? The dynamic is, geez, I'm a member of Congress. What I want to do is I want to become a government bureaucrat. Bureaucrats were pretty well paid at the time. So I create this office, and then I move into that office. And then I'm interested in creating the office for the purpose of benefiting me. This provision says, you can't do that. You're not allowed to move into an office that you participated in creating. And you're not allowed to move into an office that you participated in increasing the salary for. In both of these ways, you're cutting off the opportunity of members of Congress to move from Congress into the bureaucracy to benefit themselves as opposed to figuring out what the size of the nature of the bureaucracy should be. So here's a very strict limit to avoid that particular kind of corruption. It's called the conflict clause, the sort of avoiding conflict of interest there. Um, she sees the veto provision as another kind of effort to avoid corruption. Originally, they thought the president's veto should have to be overridden by three-fourths of Congress. But they say, well, if it's three-fourths, then a tiny number of the Senate could be bought off to avoid the override, so the president would be corrupted by that tiny little faction that would be necessary to block his veto. So they increased it, they reduced it to two thirds so that in fact there would be not an easy opportunity to buy off the representatives to avoid the override of the veto. Um, all money has to come by virtue of a law and public accounts have to be stated of this. Power of the purse, all being public, avoids corruption in the ways that not having public records would encourage corruption. And this is my favorite clause, maybe in the whole Constitution. Here it is. No title of nobility shall be granted by the United States, and no person holding any office of profit or trust under them shall, without the consent of Congress, accept any present emoluments, office, or title of any kind, whatever, from any king prince or foreign state. Right. This clause gets created in response to a problem with Benjamin Franklin. Benjamin Franklin's the uh, ambassador to France. At the end of his term, he accepts a gift, which is a snuff box that has diamonds, and it's made of gold, and it has a very beautiful painting of the uh, 
the king of France. And this gift is thought to be a scandal. And the expectation is that if we allow ambassadors to accept large gifts, then the ambassadors might be thinking, how do I make sure the king gives me a really large gift at the end of my ambassadorship, as opposed to thinking what's actually in the interest of America? So they create a provision that says you can't take any gifts unless Congress says you can, which means it's all going to be completely above board so that if you're taking a huge gift, then um, obviously it's not going to be allowed because Congress won't permit you. But if it's a small token gift, it will be allowed. So you ban gifts, not because you're trying to ban quid pro quos. You're trying to ban the gift economy. You're trying to ban even creating the nice, good feelings that would induce a, an ambassador to tilt policy in your favor or against the interest of the country. This gift ban, um, then she says, is a core device of anti-corruption. So all of these little devices, these little cogs, these little gears, little choke points in the way in which influence flows inside of Congress, she says are set up for the purpose of avoiding a certain kind of corruption. Um, the same with Article 2, with the presidency. So the president is a president. Originally, they're thinking of having three presidents. But if you have three presidents, it's easy for one of them to become corrupted. So one person is clearly responsible. That's less of a chance that they will be corrupted. The president is elected on the same day in, uh, in the Electoral College. The votes are cast in the same day. The framers, of course, live at a time where there's not tweeting. So you can't kind of tweet what the results are in one state versus another, which means it's really hard to coordinate across the country when the votes are cast in the Electoral College. Like they all on the same day open their votes and say, Connecticut in Connecticut votes, 10 votes for President Adams and Pennsylvania votes 20 votes for President Adams. You know, so those things can't be coordinated because it's on the same day and geography separates everybody. Um, the method of selecting by having a college, large number of people who are not permitted to be, um, are not permitted to be uh, members of the legislature assures these are disinterested people inside of the process. Treaty making power also tied to the Senate, so the Senate can check the president from the president being bought off by the French king. Appointments clause, the Senate has to approve the appointments of big government officials so that the president can't be bought off by somebody in order to give the appointment. The Senate would have to be part of that as well. The president can be impeached, so even after elected, even if your last term, even if you say you're not going to run again, if you fail to live up to the office's ob obligations, you can be kicked out. That's an avoid to avoid corruption. Um, uh, and, uh, and the agents who are able to bring these causes of action for impeachment are the same people in Congress would have an interest in avoiding you, the president, becoming corrupted. So once again, a series of influences designed to set up a mechanism to avoid presidential corruption. And very quickly, finally, Article 3, which is the judges. They set up inferior federal courts. So there's a Supreme Court, and they set up lower courts to avoid, to create an, an appeal process. They want the appeal process so that the judge isn't deciding an appeal in the interest of, sorry, excuse um, me. Take your daughter down. OK. Go ahead, take her. All right, I'll stay here. So if there's an appeal process, the judge is not a judge in his own case. So you have somebody else you're appealing to. And the jury requirement, very importantly, the framers say juries are not going to be corrupted. Judges can be corrupted. Judges can be bought off. Judges can become cynical about defendants or cynical about plaintiffs. But the juries will be a constant change to make it so that that process is not going to be corrupted. So in all of these cases, what she's describing are these mechanisms, these tools, which the framers create to create a structure to avoid corruption. All right, this is the defining character, she says, of what the Constitution's about. And it should be relevant to the Supreme Court, at least to the originalists on the Supreme Court. If the originalists on the Supreme Court want to understand what Congress's power should be to, for example, regulate campaign finance, 
is the Supreme Court realizes the whole purpose of the structure of the Constitution is to give a government that avoids the incentives of corruption. Here's a motivating purpose for understanding what Congress's power with respect to that should be. So the power should include this power to regulate to avoid corruption. Okay. All right. So the particulars, you don't, I mean, it'd be great if you memorize them, but don't worry about memorize. That was a joke. That was not serious. Um, <laughs> there's no quiz about the particulars. Um, but is the argument of the general form clear? There are questions about how that's working or what she's claiming or the particular assertion that this is what it's about. It's about corruption. Yeah. Sorry. So if the Constitution is to prevent corruption, her argument is that Congress should have the ability to pass laws to prevent corruption? Well, so, right, great question. So if the Constitution structure to avoid this kind of corruption. That should inform, at least, Congress's power to regulate to avoid corruption. It still doesn't answer this question, well, what do you mean by corruption? That, we're going to get to that right now. But it still says, look, look, they were all about trying to avoid corruption, so Congress should also be allowed to take steps to avoid that kind of corruption. And the court said that's true with respect to bribery, quid pro quo corruption. But the question we're trying to answer now is, is it true for something beyond just quid pro quo corruption, something more than just quid pro quo corruption? And that's, and that's the question we just, we're going to answer in one second. But that's where we are right now. It's, just, it's all about corruption. And before she wrote this, the only people who were talking about corruption were historians talking about the Republican tradition. As far as the Supreme Court was concerned, the Constitution was about separation of powers and um, bicameralism and about federalism. Those were the issues of the Supreme Court that the court characterized the Constitution was about. And she's saying, no, this, you're missing the most, this is um, the most important part. Uh, Hamlet, this is the prince. Um, corruption is the core motivating idea here. And these other things are just devices to make it easier to avoid that corruption. So she identifies having only one president and anti-corruption mechanism. <coughs> Right, so, no, I, don't, I, I think with respect to corruption, that's the argument. But again, what she's saying, I, I mean, I've emphasized this in a way that might be seen misleading. I'm not saying that she's saying the only reason for these things is that. It's just these are all devices that have this flavor. And she gives quotes from the floor of the convention where these constitutions are being debated to show why they saw these provisions as actually helping to avoid corruption, quote unquote corruption. But that's the objective. We set these things up, we create lots of incentives to avoid corruption, structures to avoid corruption. So if you think back to the very first, um, you know, uh, to Bill's lecture from last week, the Thursday lecture, the question is how do you set up institutions that have the incentives, the right incentives to avoid that bad behavior you're trying to avoid here? That's what she's saying. That's what they were doing. They were playing Bill's game. Um, they, listened, they had the same class with Bill that you're having right now. They understood this is the objective. How do we set up the rights incentives? And that's what they built through this long list of very weird, kind of tiny little gears, a system of incentives to avoid that. Okay, other questions there? All right, so here's the weakness to our argument. We come back to this question, well, what do you mean by corruption? It's all about corruption, but what does corruption mean? She says there are two features. The first is corruption is, termed in, is defined in terms of attitudes towards the public service, not in relation to a set of criminal laws. OK, so it's about the wrong attitude. And the second interesting thing is that citizenship is understood to be a public office. That's a weird point. We'll get back to, not in this class, but later. But the point about the first one is corruption exists when a narrow benefit was sought and received. The mental attitude and approach towards government was intrinsic to the description. So what they're saying is all of these steps that they're trying to avoid are steps that would be about somebody trying to get something from the government to benefit themselves. It's an attitude, a mental attitude. I intend to do this to benefit me. But that way of talking about corruption makes it sound a lot like what the Supreme Court was talking about when it said quid pro quo corruption, this for that. 
It's all about the actual intent to produce a result that benefits me. But is that really what they were meaning by corruption? Well, we wanted to look at that. So some research assistants look at every single time that the framers used the word corruption. There are 325 times they do it. I'm not going to go through 325 times. You're not. But here they are, 325 times when they use the word corruption. Actually, when they use it, it's more like that. OK, so corruption. <laughs> and these assistants then coded the uses of the word corruption. These were the law students who did it. Um, to decide, what did they mean it, use it to mean? Did they use it to mean quid pro quo corruption? This for that? Did they need it to mean hints? Did they need it to mean corruption of institutions or corruption of individuals? Because, of course, the way the court makes it sound, the court makes it sound as if the only corruption out there is corruption of quid pro quo. That's the corruption. And the originalists make it sound as if the framers were worried about quid pro quo. So indeed, the framers did talk about six about quid pro quo corruption. Of the 325 times that we found the word corruption used, they meant quid pro quo corruption six times. Six times. 1.8% of the sample, they were referring to quid pro quo corruption. So they were worried about the idea of somebody bribing somebody else, no doubt. They just weren't worried about it a lot. That wasn't the thing they were trying to attack. And every single time they use the word quid pro quo, yeah. Well, what it might be that they're talking about something other than or in addition to corruption that isn't found by searching on the word corruption. But what these researchers did is every time they find the word corruption, they're not looking necessarily just for the words quid pro quo. They're looking for the pattern of behavior, which is the sort of thing that quid pro quo corruption attacks. Okay, so it's not just the words quid pro quo but it is somebody being bribed to do something against the public interest. That's the quid pro quo. And they found that six times, 1.8%. And whenever they found it, they're always talking about individuals. They're not talking about institutions. They're talking about individuals. But in the balance of the time, speaking of individuals was relatively rare. Only 43% of the cases were cases where you're talking about individual corruption. Much more common was talk about institutions. So 57% of the cases were cases where they were talking about institutions becoming corrupt, the way we talk about parliament being corrupt. And the most common form of institutional corruption was talking about this improper dependence. This improper dependence, the way that I said, like the British parliament was improperly dependent on the king. That improper dependence therefore corrupted the parliament. So 9% of the cases which means five times the amount of time that they spoke of the words quid pro quo corruption, they were talking about the improper dependence of an institution. That's what they meant by corruption. That's what they were using the word corruption for. Okay, so how does this matter? Well, it matters if you are lucky enough to be one of those five justices who's a, an originalist, or if you're unlucky enough to be one of those five justices to be an originalist, you take your pick of what that is. But, if you're one of those justices who's an originalist, you would have to say, geez, if corruption means anything, if I can use the word corruption to mean anything, then it's got to mean improper dependence, whatever else it means. This is the normal way in which they use the word. That's got to be a use that we allow. Or another way of saying it is only a non-originalist, somebody who doesn't care about the original meaning of the Constitution, could could argue that the word corruption should be limited to this word quid pro quo corruption alone. So for an originalist, you've got to say corruption is both about the individual and about the institution. So what that has to mean is that when the court reviews laws that try to limit, quote, corruption, it can't limit itself to quid pro quo corruption alone. It's got to be able to limit it. It's also, also got to be able to consider, to review, to permit laws that attempt to avoid what we might think of as dependent corruption or institutional corruption as applied to what Congress does. Okay. So I'm gonna, we're going to stop right here. We've got just one or two minutes for questions about this, but this argument continues as we go into the rest of it.
going to do for this week. So are there questions about this right now? Yeah. Great question. So the question is, which is which hurts more, quid pro quo corruption or dependence corruption? And it kind of depends on where depends on where and when you're talking about. It. So I think Africa is filled with quid pro quo corruption. The governments of Africa, to the extent they are corrupt, that's the problem that it devastates their ability to exist. But in the United States right now, between quid pro quo corruption and the Dependence corruption, I think the quid pro quo corruption is a tiny amount of harm compared to the dependence corruption. The reason is quid pro quo corruption has shame. You know, at least, you know, you're, if you're engaging in quid pro quo corruption, you're, you hide it. It's illegal. You, you're not proud of it. But the dependence corruption, when you, you know, engage in fundraising, you raise $50 million for your party, you brag about it. It's out in the open. It's the sort of thing everybody is completely happy to do. So it has no natural constraints the way quid pro quo corruption does. And so therefore, I think, ultimately, the consequences of, of it are going to be much greater. Okay. So we'll pick up here when we start back on Thursday. Thanks very much.